step forward. Hello, everyone. This is C Diesel. I have the Louche V and King of the Comics, Professor E, Ethan Murphy with us. And today, quiz and session, everybody. Uh, guys, this what, is only your first time back. Right I started fucking up when I was talking, and I was like, "Well, I'm with Mike Tyson now, I guess." We're just gonna Mike Tyson. I was gonna say, that's a, he said access. That's a lisp accent. So you think you get the fastest fist? Bro, back is broken. What a, a vertebrae or, or well, a portion? Spinal. Anyway. Unless you can, unless you're a heavyweight boxer, I wouldn't run around with that. Not at all, bro. Like, you, as a heavyweight boxer, that's Mike. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, guys, we are making a return to reviewing stuff. We haven't done a review in a good minute, like a sit down review like this. So I'm excited and even more excited because we're doing another audio drama. We haven't done one of those since Batman Unburied, which we did uh, almost a couple months ago now, not too long ago. Uh, we are doing a Harley Quinn of a sound mind. This to me was a really enjoyable watch. Um, Listen. I'll let we'll, we'll start with, we'll start with Otis and get like your this preliminary over overview of it. Um, and then we'll move on to Ethan and then we'll kind of get into the nitty gritty of things. Yeah, um, I, I really enjoyed uh, this podcast. Uh, hearing uh, Christina Ricci's take on Harley Quinn was was pretty mm -hmm. well done, man. I think uh, she, I mean, she's always been great and stuff like this, and uh, to to see her be able to continue that process is definitely uh, was enjoyable. Well, not see here because it's a audio. Yeah. You, hey, but, for um, me, I see it whenever I'm watching it. Yeah. Right? I told you. If if it, if it's if it's that immersive that you feel like you're watching it, that's, that's saying something. So, mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. My bad. I was just saying. I think uh, it was pretty well set up. Um, it's, it's it is a shorter uh, podcast, but I, I don't really have any issues with the, uh, any of the pacing words of the POI we just finished. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was a pretty well done thing. Well, I'll, let, I'll let pass to Brody E over there to see what you think, Professor. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. First, you got you have your shout outs, uh, flowers to the name alone of Sound Mind. It's like, aha, uh -huh, I see, I see what you did there. It's a podcast about mm -hmm. these about a psychologist. It's like, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Triple on times, you don't even ask me how. If, if they did it, they made it work. They made it work. Uh, and uh, obviously, of course, flowers to the Christina Ritchie. She did wasn't putting on a voice to sound like Harley Quinn, but it, her, the voice she had worked really well. It seems like it it, it fit for what the character mm -hmm. you know is, and ultimately becomes too. Also, it seems appealing as far as given what the Joker is attracted to or whatever he likes to do, it's like, yeah, that could, I could see that kind of a, because we know what she looks like, but also just hearing the voice, it's like, I could see the attraction to someone like that. It's, she sounded, she seemed strong yet acute at the same time. I mean, I mean, in the best possible way, uh, not just her, but the voice acting for the Joker too, especially in the sixth episode, the way he, when he seemed, when he seemed genuinely vulnerable, he was like, yeah. kind of getting into his backstory. It's like, yeah, this actually, his, this voice actor, actor, Billy and Magnuson, the Mag something, Billy, Billy Magnuson, Magnuson. Yeah, that's, that's I, I'm good. sorry if you're, we're mispronouncing your name really bad. Billy, I know we probably are, but, but shout, yeah, out Billy. Billy. shout out to Billy. Shout out to Billy. Billy. They did a great. They did a. He did a great, great job. And of course, got to give flowers to the last person. Of course, of all is a uh, Otis's buddy uh, with Bill from uh, King of the Hill, Stephen Root, as the kind of obnoxious head of uh, psychology at the at, at Arkham. So yeah. Mm hmm. Uh yeah, this for me honestly, I believe I like this better than Batman Unburied to me. Um, <laughs> Hard not to. Yeah, guy. Okay, yeah, solid. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's not a. The thing that I like about these DC audio dramas is that there's at least for these ones over the Rogues Gallery of Batman is that because all his patients, all his uh Rogues Gallery are like mental health patients where they have a mental health issue, you can write so well with how these characters see the world, their modus operandi. One of my favorite things was when uh, Harley would sit down and talk with uh, the ventriloquist. Because it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. think where it's not like threatening, but at the same time, it's just so well done. Like I felt like I was sitting in on someone talking to a mental health patient. And I love that they did the thing that a lot of the great Batman media do where they not only analyze Batman as a character and as a personality, but like the city of Gotham. And they were like, diagnosing it as if it was a living human being and kind of getting into that stuff i i, I love when the writing is just this that well done uh for it, me personally yeah and going on that too the i like how with harley analyzed uh she a she broke down like you said patience b she broke down uh gotham as far as the problem the plight that the city was having and then c she hit a bruce wayne like you know this is 
do you understand what's going on here, rich boy? I mean, and so it's kind of like to the point where it actually affected him, where he actually wanted to have a campaign or had a campaign, have like a, some kind of a program in Arkham trying to actually help the, help the patients. Uh, it kind of reflected Bruce Wayne a little, little bit of his Batman out when he was like talking about them as far as like these are just you know those, these are just criminals that are, have mental issues. And she's like, no, these are actually people that that are in need. And you don't seem to want to help them. So it's kind of it really was uh, getting a, a little clue in a way that I didn't expect it would expect it to do. So I, I appreciate it. That is one like critique, but not critique I have on it is this Bruce Wayne slash Batman seems so oblivious to everything that was going on in his city. Mm -hmm. yeah. For somebody that grew up in the city and it's Batman and you're on the streets every night, I don't understand how you're so oblivious to the effect you have, which I guess into, to a, an extent you can argue that, that the Batman from the comics knows that to a certain, depending on the version, is a similar way. But the conversations that he would have with Harley just seemed like, what do you mean I'm causing this? Batman would never do that. So much so, to I'm just like, so how does she not know he's Batman the way he's like defending this so mm. hard? But part of it too is I think he was also playing a little of the, he was turning on as far as like the, his uh, being coy or being playing right. dumb because he's Bruce. He's like, he can't be too informed. He's not supposed to be. Uh, yeah, so. Right, I mean, I think they, the the relationship uh, between Harley and Bruce, I think, was set up uh, honestly pretty well to to mm -hmm. set her up uh, as an antagonist to not only the Batman but to Bruce Wayne directly. Mm -hmm. um, the dialogue they had between each other, the 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 relationship that you know that they had based off of like you know where her father worked and and uh, his his uh, com his family's company owning the that facility. I mean, very well set up, like. It, it, the entire series felt very grounded in the sense where, like, I mean, yes, you have these grandiose characters and and, and personalities, but you kind of get a, a understanding of how they got to the point that we know them as so traditionally. Like, mm -hmm. uh, to see the the inner workings of why Joker got to be himself, why, uh, to understand his attraction to Harley and their relationship, to understand uh, why Harley ended up going down the line to going to Joker and wanting that. Like, I, I think they all were explained very well. I think that uh, the performance between all of the characters, they all had a chemistry to each other. Like, it, it, it felt so natural, the conversations, it, that it felt less like a fantastic story in the DC universe when, like, oh, these are just mental patients <laughs> dealing with things in real life. And I, mm, I, and I, yeah. I like content like that. I knew, I knew, I was waiting for you to say it. It felt exactly like if someone just said this is a a crime drama, almost a true crime type of thing, which is very popular, especially on podcasts. And the word Batman and Joker specifically weren't there, it would just be, it'd be fine. If you, you almost think this was an episode of like Law and Order, Special Victims Unit, or whatnot, you would, it just plays like that very much so. And right. the, um, I, one thing I was waiting for that what happened would be a whole, you know, convoluted, nonsensical romance between Harley Quinn and Joker. That does not happen. It doesn't go. It doesn't go down that route. It may. It leads. It leads into it a little bit where they can see that they can. They both of them do understand each other's. Uh, where they're coming from their perspectives, but it does like Otis said. It stays grounded and, and, and it makes sense. And I love that this that Batman in particular, this the Bat family and the Bat stories in the DC universe. That's a the noir. The noir aspect of it makes it pliable to do that with the stories that they're telling. Uh, you couldn't do trying to go too grounded with a Superman story. It's like. I don't know, man. This dude can fly and shoot lasers out of his eyes. What are, you, what are you talking about? So, but this world, it does make sense. So let's let's go ahead and get into the actual plot before you get too far into it. Uh, for a lot of people, you may not recognize a lot of the origins here because they did take creative liberty and change up the origins a little bit. Uh, Dr. Harleen Quinzel obviously is working at Arkham Asylum, like you would normally see here. But the twist is that she has her father who is dying from a cancer that was acquired from him working at a pharmaceutical, well, some kind of plant. I don't remember what the exact, for something to do with uh, polymer, or some kind of material that was being it, made and worked there it, forever. Is it, is, it, is, it, is it the Ace Chemicals plant, ironically enough? Is that what it is? It, it may have been, I don't remember, no, there was a name for it. It was okay. some sort of name, it was like a subsidy, sub, yeah, whatever. It's one of those subsidiary, yeah. subsidiary companies that a lot of these organizations and corporations have. Sure. But that being said, she's there, Patient J comes in, and she obviously is a young, aspiring, hungry psychologist. So she wants to take on the challenge to treat him. But obviously there's a little bit of a patriarchy going on within there. So you have the guy that, uh, the guy from King of the Hills playing the head doctor and you have Bill, 
<laughs> Bill was talking hot shit. Well, b- both both of them were talking hot shit. This to me is the stop here is like the first part that was done really well to me that I really enjoyed was you kind of already saw it coming a mile away with them gassing up their strengths and their confidence in being like uh a psychologist in that sense where he's like i don't exactly how to treat patient j he's xyz has these delusions of grandeur or whatever the thing is i got this and then not too long after that you see him come out and he's broken and this is like the first voice performance to me that really stood out where this guy was you could he was broken and terrified and that to me came across in his voice and in his performance here's his file Wow, Bob, what are you? Did you forget your happy pills this it's morning? It's your problem now. I'm sorry, who are you, oh, you talking joke. about? No, it, it's patient. Listen, uh, he cannot be cured. Bob, 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 what happened in there? What, what about shake him up and He's pop the sick. top? He, he is the disease. Look, send him to Blackheath before he infects everybody in here. No, well, that would be a little tricky in terms He's of paperwork. Right. All those things he said. I'm, I'm a good person. Right? I know I've made certain mistakes, but I, I keep, I, I, Are you crying? I deserve to live. Uh, can you guys speak on that for um, how that impacted you first? And we can go to Ethan first and talk about Black Mom. Yeah, of course. So, I, I, they, I mean, this is something that's done, we've talked about this at, at great length. In wrestling, they call it putting someone over. So mm-hmm. with Joker, before you hear his voice or before you see him, he's talked up. And they don't say they don't mention the name Joker. They just talk about this this guy they found basically a John Doe. They call him Jay because it's like a John Doe. And he and um, they seen these psychiatrists in the Arkham seem like they they've seen it all, they've seen it all, they can handle it all. Uh nothing can surprise them at all. And this guy comes in with the biggest bravado. I think it's his bill or whatever it is, like, oh, this is yeah, nothing. Bill, yeah. Wanna take him on. And he goes in there with, for a few minutes with Joker. And he's like you said, he's broken. He's done. And but the the voice actor does an amazing job of kind of conveying the the uh, the haughty toddy uh, kind of over overconfident ego that he has in the beginning, and then see him come out there with the, the frantic. You, you can you can almost hear him sweating, bullets of sweat. Essentially, and I, <laughs> no, I love that that's kind crazy. of. Uh, but, but it works. With, it works extremely well. I love that, and I love also you can almost hear Harley Quinn rolling her eyes like, yeah, I told you so. A and B, like you have to treat them like more more people because she seems like someone that's actually trying to do something for real as opposed to just trying to get a paycheck mm-hmm. uh and all, and all that comes like you said all that comes across in the voice performances otis yeah i mean i think the the ability that they show within this series to truly paint the, a scene completely off of audio is definitely at a high level um the there's like a uh, all everything down to the the cadence from how they spoke to each other the inflections that they had in their voices really made it seem like they were directly in these places having these conversations with each other when we have obviously we know that's not the case like they're not there is no arkham asylum in real life you know but it all the 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 feel of it the 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 small the sound notes they added to to make sure the aesthetic of the the sound was right like all really uh, made it a, a, an immersive experience and i give that to credit to the, all the cast for including uh the including that process to make it that way yeah uh, real quick just to piggyback off what you're both saying i watched the green mile just last night i know it's three hours but i'm an old man uh and i love that movie and it's a lot of it takes place in on death row you know with bars and everything and when mm. the characters are in they're, when they're on death row you hear the way it sounds with the bars and the echo and everything they did an amazing job of creating that uh audibly you can tell when Harley Quinn and them are in Arkham as opposed to when Harley Quinn's back at her apartment with her dad mm-hmm. or when she's, you know, uh, at the hospital. Where, like, you can always tell where they're supposed to be. That's a small detail that a good production team will do with audio play. Yeah, sound design was immaculate here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Acting, I guess, to get into acting one more time. This felt like, to me, almost like the purest form of acting where, it, to me, you could have just been them, like, line reading together, but it was done so well. And you, it, it felt like everybody had a certain level of chemistry like when you're building a scene and you like with, with Bill and Harley, for instance, obviously they work together for some amount of time. So they have a rapport. I felt like that. Like I, I could hear and feel the chemistry between her, her father, whoever else they spoke to, to tell it this is a world that's been here before. And we didn't just walk into something just being painted. It felt mm-hmm. like it was weird. Like we we're just peeking in the window through something. 
Uh, but okay. to move further into the story, obviously, I'm not going to go like little by little, but we'll take a huge jump in. Obviously, Harley has interactions with her and Patient J. Um, and it's very interesting because in my head, obviously, I've seen all the other media that portrays the relationship and the abusive nature of it, all the Stockholm Syndrome, all that stuff going on. This was a very different take where it wasn't found in abuse or her love for his craziness. It was him trying that initially it felt like he was trying to go that direction but she wasn't going for it and he kind of humbled himself to an extent and you see that for at the end of the conversation she's like oh you have to cut this early oh he was in the middle of a joke or something and she's like yeah i gotta leave early to take care of something and for him i guess he was so used to like with bill people are so intrigued in him but her just doing that like threw him off his game he like humbled himself from that point on in here in this conversation with her this is probably the most reserved reserved grounded joker i've ever heard or seen or any like in any portrayal i've seen he was very yes. humbled from so, her so we'll, we'll, two two real quick things i'll say then I'll let otis go because i keep on i talk too much i know um one is that we have to acknowledge this is a this is a different harley because this harley uh, unlike the lore we we're used to has a healthy relationship with her father Mm -hmm. This isn't a broken daddy's girl. This is someone who actually has a healthy father. Who has, she's very much dedicated to her father. And because of that, I imagine that if that, that relationship they had made her more resistant uh, or uh, to someone like the Joker, he can't manipulate her as well. Um, and and two, I love the idea that because the Joker is such a, a master manipulator, like he always is, it's when he stops trying to manipulate her at the end where she does start actually feeling something for him. Also, mm -hmm. it's after her dad died. And I'm not saying that Harley and Joker is meant to be, she has a, what they say in some capacities that women oftentimes fall for guys are mind of their, of their dad. Um, doctors tend to, or nurses or doctors, what have you, they love, of course, helping people. And it's very common for them to want to, the whole Florence Nightingale syndrome where, the, where a patient falls in love with their, with, with their, uh, with their nurse, mm -hmm. or nurse or what have you you could tell some of that was happening in here and it was by, it was going both ways in a way that has never been done before and i really enjoyed that yeah um i think there was an interesting take on how they kind of flipped the power dynamic because we are used to harley quinn being the one that was constantly you know behind the eight ball with joker like she he was the putting out the manipulation she was forming her thoughts like he 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 molded harley into what we got in the end and in this one, I feel like it was a, a little bit of the reverse. Like she, she kind of de developed how she wanted the standard for their relationship to go between her and Joker, and he had to kind of adjust to her instead of the, yeah. the usual vice versa. Um, I think they did they, they did that very well. Um, I think they did a good job in kind of really building the both of their attachment to each other like it didn't seem mm -hmm. like it was something that was forced or uh i think i mean obviously knowing the characters and knowing the lore of batman you knew how this was going to end up but it didn't feel like it was just like uh the cookie cutter it was supposed to happen this just felt like oh i saw you did that but i i know joker reacted like this because of that i know harley reacted like this because of that mm -hmm. like building up that 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 true motivation to to get to that ending spot, I think they did uh, really well in this. Uh, you don't get to see that uh, often, in my opinion, especially in content like this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. On that same token, to go a little bit further down the story, obviously this is there are a couple interactions. You start to see Harley's her 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 strength. She has this innate like womanly strength that I can only like reference to like someone like a Michelle Obama almost, where it's this like strength and elegance. And she knows what she is and the power she has. And you see that through her manipulation of a lot of her uh, patients. It's even a little, it's a, it's a little scarier to me because she has a knowledge on how the human mind works and how their mind works. So you see yep. her do that when she's manipulating Joker with the whole Trevor thing, where he makes the little quip about the dude named Trevor. And she immediately starts to spin that into, well, Trevor didn't do X, Y, and Z for me, or this and this could have happened. And he's like, she's getting him invested. That thing that a lot of a, a lot of dudes I know fall for when they get it wrapped around somebody's finger, man, woman, or indifferent. Um, and that was really dope to me to see the how she how well she did that. And just Christina Ritchie's outstanding performance because it was like her voice changed a little bit to where mm -hmm. it was like kind of seductive almost, and yeah. you heard it. It's the little stuff that she did, and I was like, damn, she she got Buddy wrapped around his finger, around yeah. her finger. 
it wasn't just him. It was also, of course, Arnold. You mentioned before the uh, the ventriloquist. Mm-hmm. For those yeah. who don't know, the, uh, the character Scarface, the person who ventriloquizes him is named Arnold. Um, mm-hmm. That character was amazing too because I I'd never seen this portrayal of him. He always seems more meek and kind of mm-hmm. the victim of Scarface or that part of his personality, so to speak, the multiple personality uh, uh, sort he may have. But this one was interesting. He had a very his character was interesting in and of itself. Mm-hmm. And when he, when he himself, as Arnold, was talking to Harley Quinn, having Harley, how Harley pretty much got him to basically use a sock puppet. Socko. She, Socko. He little, it was an amazing character, by the way. Uh, mm-hmm. how, how she got him to use Socko, basically because she knew that he would talk to her more uh, if if he let down his walls, was, was less guarded. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's something that in real life, good therapists, good psychologists, uh, psych- psychiatrists can do. And you said she's she was... I think what it was is for the first time, the Joker got out manipulated, and it may it wasn't necessarily meant to be a negative thing, but he definitely it did if it happened to him, you know. All right, others. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't necessarily have uh, any new points to add on to that. Just uh, just continuing the fact that they this this is a series that they feel like they had a, a different level of care for. Like mm-hmm. it, it seems like they were like. You can tell that Christina Ricci, like, uh, cared for how she was portrayed as Harley Quinn. So, like, mm-hmm. you know, the it was very meticulous and, and deliberate. All of her lines, how she delivered certain things, and uh, I think that is something that I wish that we could see in more forms of uh, superhero content, like mm-hmm. having people that are actually dedicated and related to the content that they're portraying instead of just doing the role to get the, the cash itself feels like sometimes. Right. To yeah. continue to that point, to, as far as the care, one thing I wanted to harp on really quickly is the level of detail when it comes to people that may be fans. We talked earlier about how you could not have the title and not know who these characters were and have that, but the fact you do makes it a little bit better because they have a lot of references to really like in like in-depth characters you have to be fans like maxi zeus was mentioned in this he was, briefly. He was uh yeah. croc was in it at some point but they mentioned him really briefly in turn like saying the snake saying his name it's a way aaron, way aaron, yeah. aaron cash but people played the arkham games you know who cash is mm-hmm. they made these subtle little references throughout it to where in my head i, was, I, I listened to it with a friend while she was here and she's just watching it in my head i'm just like oh they said that i know him or i know this that and third like a little child uh, it's things like that we, we've talked about in the show a million times about like attention to detail and people that care about the source material and that is very apparent in this yeah it, it, and that I, I love what you said both of you guys are talking about of course but one thing i thought about otis brought up the idea as far as it exploring this kind of story do you think this would have worked as well if it wasn't done in this format if it wasn't done as a podcast let's say you try doing this as a either an animated episode or a mini movie. I mean, it's because it was all the episodes combined make for about 120 minutes, a two hour feature film. Mm-hmm. Do you think this will work as a feature film or? I, I could, but I think the benefit that things like this have is that people aren't paying attention to other stuff. It was animated. We pay attention to the animation, acting. We look at like set design, things like that. But the fact this is just audio and just this, it's like acting and production. And it's like its highest form because you're only focused on those things. So if they're not done well, you notice, but if they are done well, you really notice. I agree. I mean, I feel like if you put uh, the level of attention to detail that they put into this series into most things, it'll 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 translate pretty well. I mean, you can't get everything perfect, but I mean, even down to like they were thinking about the Batman lore on a critical level, and that's not something that you typically see within mm-hmm. these type of uh, mediums. Like, I mean, you don't you don't see anybody uh, within uh, uh, Captain America breaking down the actual pol- politics behind the, the motives of uh, their what they're doing. I wonder As why. opposed to this, like you get well that's, that's a, not that's, that's not a whole another, that's another yeah, podcast that's but um <laughs> but as opposed to this like you know you like harley quinn literally psychoanalyzes that like we, we mentioned earlier but yeah batman the city of gotham half of the the uh the people in arkham that she she did like bruce wayne she does analyze bruce right, wayne. like you don't get that level of uh self-reflection in in most superhero content in fact they usually try to keep it pretty light or maybe uh, focus on the overarching tone of something that they're trying to portray. Right. But like, yeah, you, you never get the, the actual psychology of why a person is doing what they're doing 
in, in I, superhero content like so that. that's why i think it's perfect for this media because they had the carte blanche because they didn't have to worry about money or big budget they were able to tell a very different story very nuanced story mm-hmm. the more super grounded kind of a more adult story without having to worry about having trying to you know, make a dollar or having to be like, like the joker movie by todd phillips making a hundred million dollars they could do a very elseworld kind of a story take a chance with it and not have to worry about anything to have a you know, hanging over their head so mm. to get into a little bit of the psychoanalyzation of gotham itself uh one thing that i really thought was interesting was their take on why the villains became a thing and we we see we've seen this before where they said that the reason that the supervillains escalated was the fact that because Batman made crime harder, the villains had to up their ante and that spread to other things. But the thing that was different about this is that she made it a point to talk about the people of Gotham not being heard or not being seen because obviously they're poor or whatnot. And that led to them seeing Batman getting publicity, being seen, being celebrated, doing crazy stuff. And then that escalated the thing. And I think that was somewhat real again the other one's pretty realistic as well but i think this is really realistic to modern day society where you see the internet now where you'll see people do like pranks or little things and they'll get attention and you just see people having to up the end to do crazier a lot of times stupider stuff to get that attention and to get that celebratory uh celebratory nature that they seek so much and to me that just hit a lot harder because i was looking at that as like i don't know if that was meant in the writing but it felt like a mirror into like what we are now I'm sure it was. I mean, yeah, I completely agree. That that was something that was brought up to me in the Batman the animated series back in the day when the characters themselves put Batman on trial, but then also the idea as far as they, they wore costumes and things of that nature because Batman wore a costume. Uh, they were trying to be on the same level as him. If he's a superhero, we had to be super villains. But uh, as you're, it's been addressing the, the actual uh, specifics that you have as far as the, the internet and social media these days with things, it is very much, if this person's getting attention for doing A, B, and C, then I have to do this much more to get that much mm-hmm. more attention um even if it's a criminal it may be someone that genuinely is starving genuinely is having problems if they feel that society won't recognize their problems because they don't wear a costume and go around on rooftops then they'll do whatever they have to to get them to see them for, mm-hmm. for maybe even for good causes sometimes so it's i agree that makes perfect sense all right well to i guess we can kind of skip again i'm just kind of skipping through the story because all these were released at one time uh, it was one season, so we didn't have the thing with Batman and Bigger. We had to review them week by week. So moving toward the end of, of the story and seeing, we talked about the manipulation of a Harley with the Joker and how that went. I think it was very interesting to see that not flipped on his head completely near the end in their final interaction at the dock. Well, not their final interaction, but near one of their final interactions. But it was interesting to see how Harley went in with, after all their conversations, he already had like a preconceived notion about who he was and how he operated. And at the end, you see him get really kind of tender in a moment where he's kind of given his backstory um, and kind of giving her condolences for her father and things of that nature. It, it, it seemed like he was very much so concerned with her as a person. And you kind of saw him drop the facade that he had going on earlier when he was trying to romance her. So much so that Buddy like read a, a romance book to get her and was like genuine about that. I was like, damn, that's wild. Like he does care for her. And it was it was refreshing to see that different of a take. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He 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 simps. Mm-hmm. Like at the end of the day, they they made Joker the simp. He did. I mean, he did. It's funny. I never thought about Joker being a simp, but he definitely. I mean, it, it, I guess she was a simp for him forever. So it's, mm-hmm. it's only talking about fair play because he definitely he robbed the. Um, you would mm-hmm. think my first thought was he was going to rob the museum, get the money, what have you. And of course, never give it to her. Just take off. But mm-hmm. he actually did it, and one hundred percent was there for him. And, and she and once <laughs> once he did, she was like, "Well, all right, later, get away from me." And he and she. Told him off at the hospital. She had pretty much told him to get the fuck off and never come back. So I was like, ah, dang, okay, fair enough. Harley. He was he hurt. Was, he was mad as fuck. He was he was all kinds of broke. I, I never seen a guy more butt hurt in my life. So it's, right. it's a very different dynamic. He was so hurt that he was at a point where he called security on her. Like, get her away from me. <laughs> like, so I mean. And to it, know that uh, she had the hooks at him so bad that even after that, he's still like, all right, come on back. I miss you. Like, mm-hmm. That's right. After that, he was still like willing to do it. Yeah. And he and think about this. Think about how much they everyone considers Batman the greatest, world's greatest detective, right? And the Joker has fooled Batman countless times in the comic books and in various mediums. But he falls for a trap for Harley Quinn. So mm-hmm. it's, I mean, she he, he really was sprung. I've never seen him do that sprung. It's been a long time. This this 
this version, I will say the one weird thing about this version of the Joker, one, it's cool because he obviously is different and a lot more open. He, he felt more like the the early early Joker where he was kind of doing pranks. Like what, even when him robbing the museum, he like was talking to kids and kind of having a good time and then let them yeah. go. Like he didn't really he do anything yeah. super yeah. dangerous. But that, the, that kind of threw me off because in the beginning when they had the almost Heath Ledger like thing going on where Bill was like traumatized. I'm thinking, oh, it's about to be really dark. And then from then on, it never really got back to that tone of True. the Joker. It was more the happy go lucky one that you would see in the earlier versions of like some Adam West type stuff, maybe. That's true, but I wonder. Keep in mind, keep in mind, we're we're seeing this exclu we're seeing the Joker exclusively from the eyes of Harley. Mm -hmm. And it's we made it clear that he's pursuing her. I wonder how different he is with everybody else. We know in our own lives, in real life, we are different. Otis has an amazing, wonderful girlfriend. He's different with her than he is with us. Uh, so it's guys are it, people. We're different with with people. We we are depending on our relationship with them, so to speak. True. To get into that too, the one where him and his relationship with Batman, it felt like they didn't really have much of one. Like, they didn't. Either, yeah. either this is really early on, or because even when Batman would come around, he'd be like, "Dude, it was annoying." It wasn't a thing where he was obsessed with me. He's like, I fucking hate him because he arrests me. He's annoying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, even like that final, final scene where like he pops up to arrest him. He's like, bruh, it's my girl. Chill out. I'm like, go do some other shit. Mm -hmm. He wasn't yeah. really obsessed with him. He was all for Harley, which again, it was dope to see that flip on his head. But usually you're used to Batman and Joker being in this like endless, abusive, weird, sometimes homoerotic relationship. I mean, but that's, it's, like, a, that's a romance. That's a romance. <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about? That's a romance. But because I think I think it's because the Joker is used to pursuing Batman, having Batman trying to get, trying to garner Batman's affection. Mm -hmm. Because Harley Quinn was rebuffed, was was kind of rebuking him so much, he was dedicated to her in a way. So Batman was now all of a sudden on the on the outside, getting in his way. And then I had gathered that uh, just from the some of the things that they said within the series that this was pretty early in Batman's tenure. Like this didn't mm -hmm. seem like a, a seasoned Batman that's been around for a while. At least uh, at least that's when I got. Yeah, the way they were commenting on the Batman doing things, it was like he was still new. They didn't really know what to do. I think it was between, because he said a date, because they talked, about, it's, I think, two years in. Like they talked about it in the hospital about how Harley said two years ago, uh, Arkham was a regular facility. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then Batman yeah, they, popped up, and now all these crazy people in costumes are here. That's right, because they, they said how few how many fewer patients they had back in the day too. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is which is another thing. Yeah, maybe he did, which is which is real. Is is he contributing to actually making people? I don't know. It's yeah, it's a lot to think about. It's a lot to think about. But yeah, um, do you want to go ahead and get into rating for the for the show? Mm -hmm. hmm. We'll go from left to right. Professor uh, Lelouch. Yeah, if I had to to score this, I'd probably give it a solid eight out of ten. Um. Again, uh, the the voice acting quality was high. The sound design was uh, high. If anything, I felt like it might have been a, a little bit too short. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, uh, I don't really have too many complaints here. Yeah, I think I'm, I agree. I wish to, I, I put it around an eight, and kind of from the same perspective of Otis, where I felt like there was more to tell uh, as far as the relationship between Joker and Harley. I, I think. I don't have to see it go the traditional route of how it got there, but I feel like there's a lot more toxicity uh, within that relationship that was coming down the pipeline, maybe. Of but course, it would just be wishful thinking, I guess. I would give it a solid nine, mainly because of the same reason you guys give it an eight. I love rule number one of entertainment, leave them wanting more. If you yeah. want more, that means everything that you had, you, you know, it's, it was still satisfying, but you hmm. want more. Uh, and I love the different, they, they were able to weave a completely different tapestry with these characters we've seen a thousand and one times in a world we're very familiar with however there was no character assassination we won't get into it won't get into it but i think this is what velma was trying to do as far as telling <laughs> different I, we're not gonna get we won't we won't we won't but you but being able to be in the same world with the same characters but use them in a different way that still feels familiar enough to, that you don't that you don't think it's a character assassination. However, it's nuanced enough that you are eager to see more. You know. Yeah, it was a, a reimagining of these characters within a spectrum that was still palatable to the fans of it, as opposed to uh, intentionally trolling the fan base, like I feel Velma does. Yeah, Jinkies. That's all I got to say. <laughs> 
Uh, guys, well, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, if you guys enjoyed the series, let us know how you what you thought in the comments below. Again, please give us a video as a favor, subscribe, like the video, share it around, all that good YouTube stuff. Uh, and again, we hope we thank you guys for your support. We hope for your continued support. We will see you guys next time. Peace. Winston Duke. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that nobody damaged their voice as much as Winston Duke did in that Batman and Buried. Mm -hmm.